Hey, uh, this is Brett, and welcome to Brett and Some Books. Today we are continuing The First Casualty by Philip Knightley. This is Chapter 9, called Commitment in Spain, 1936 to 1939. Early in life I had noticed that no event is ever correctly reported in a newspaper, but in Spain, for the first time, I saw newspaper reports which did not bear any relation to the facts, not even the relationship which is implied in an ordinary life. No other war in recent times, with the possible exception of Vietnam, aroused such intense emotion, such deep commitment, and such violent partisanship as the civil war in Spain. On one side were ranged the representatives of the old order, bankers, landlords, clergy, and army. Against them stood the peasants, the workers, the best of Spanish writers and poets, and a democratically elected government. Both sides saw the war as a crusade. The old order, the nationalists, fought to purge their country of the Reds, to resurrect their ideal of a pure Christian Spain. The republicans fought for a new age, the New Jerusalem, or, in the case of the Communists, a Marxist utopia. Most saw it as something far wider than a civil conflict. In essence, it was a class war, wrote George Orwell. If it had been won, the cause of the common people everywhere would have been strengthened. It was lost, and the dividend drawers all over the world rubbed their hands. The intervention of Hitler and Mussolini on the side of the old order and of Russia on the side of the Republic seemed to confirm this view. It became an apocalyptic moment in history, a point in time which to choose and to make a stand. Thousands of young men from Europe and America came voluntarily to Spain to fight and die for the Spanish Republic because they believed in the democratic ideal. Orwell's cause of the common people everywhere, for those who went to fight or to write, it was an experience that left none untouched, a period in their lives of major and lasting significance, and one which, nearly forty years later, remains as vivid and as moving as if it had happened yesterday. Today, wherever in this world I shall meet a man or woman, who fought for Spanish liberty, I meet a kindred soul, wrote Herbert Matthews of the New York Times. In those years, we lived our best, and what has become after, and what there is to come, can never carry us to those heights again. The correspondents committed themselves with passion. Those of us who championed the cause of the Republic, government against the Franco nationalists, were right. It was on balance the cause of justice, legality, morality, and decency. Matthews says, We knew, we just knew. Martha Gallorn says, That Spain was the place to stop fascism. This is it. It was one of the, those moments in history where there was no doubt. Most of the Spanish Civil War correspondents who held those views then hold them now. They remain unshakable, completely convinced that they were right and that actively to support the Republican cause was the only thing to do. We are concerned here not with the validity of these views, but whether such complete commitment affected the reporting of the war. Was the reporting a victory for the partisans of truth and justice? Or were newspaper readers throughout the world victims of duplicity and dissimulation? And, in examining this, we face perhaps the more dramatic form than elsewhere in the question at the heart of this book. What is a war correspondent's duty? Is it, as Drew Middleton of the New York Times says, to get the facts and write them with his interpretation of what they mean to the war without allowing personal feelings of the war to enter into the story? No one can completely be objective, but objecti objectivity is the goal. Or is Matthews closer? I would always opt for honest, open bias. A newspaper man should work with his heart as well as his mind.
from all over the world, thousands of young men who saw the war as an ideological one made their way to Spain to fight in the international brigades. The sort of personal commitment to the fight against fascism described by Ernest Hemingway in his famous Civil War novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls. This voluntary commitment involvement in a war that did not directly concern them in turn exercised the fascination for some of the most articulate and talented writers of the period men like Malro, orwell dos passos spender hemingway bessie and costler their writing had a direct influence in creating in the united states france britain and south america public concern about the war and persuaded newspapers to send to both sides their best correspondence. Hugh Thomas, the most meticulous historian of the world, of the war, notes that the greatest names in war journalism were soon to be found south of the Pyrenees and that the Spaniards were very conscious of this and were very proud of their fame. If they had set themselves the aim of reporting war objectively, then many of these distinguished correspondents, not motivated by patriotism as in, say, the First World War, went about their assignment in a remarkable manner. Hemingway, representing the North American Newspaper Alliance, had been chairman of the Ambulance Committee for the American Friends of Spanish Democracy before he accepted the NANA assignment, uh, NANA, -N -A. once again, that's North American Newspaper Alliance. He took it upon himself to instruct recruits in the international brigades in weapon drill and made frequent visits to the line, not all of which were appreciated. Jason Gurney, a London sculptor attached to the American Lincoln Battalion, remembers Hemingway loosing off a wave of machine gun bullets that provoked a mortar bombardment for which he did not stay. Claude Cockburn, editor of The Week, was on holiday in Spain when the war broke out. The Week was a famous English left-wing weekly started by Cockburn in 1933. It featured news, rumor, and inside information that never appeared in the regular press. It was banned in 1941 because of its anti-war attitude. He promptly joined the Republican militia, but saw nothing strange in continuing to be a correspondent for his magazine and for the communist newspaper, The Daily Worker. He was openly in favor of correspondents committing themselves to the Republican cause. He said he was tired of sitting in Madrid, exhorting other people to fight, and felt he should do something himself. George Orwell went to Spain to write articles for the New Statesman, but joined a fighting force raised in Barcelona. Matthew Corman, a Belgian correspondent, covered the Republican advance on Teruel with a live grenade in his left hand and a pistol in his right. Jim Lardner, Ring Lardner's son, went to report for the New York Herald Tribune but left to join an international brigade and was killed. Arthur Costler went as a correspondent for the London News Chronicle, but this was a cover for his common turn activities. H.A.R. Kim Philby went as a correspondent for the Times of London on the nationalist side, but was also a Soviet intelligence agent. Perhaps the clearest way of complete commitment and almost total abandonment of objectivity was that of Louis Fisher, reporting for the American magazine The Nation. No sooner had Fisher arrived in Madrid than he was offering advice on the conduct of the war to the Soviet ambassador. Write me a memo, the ambassador told him, and I'll send it to Moscow. Next, Fisher appeared as quartermaster at the International Brigade's depot in Albacete, where he remained until he fell out with the chief commissar, the veteran French communist and hatchet man, André Marty. All this time, 
while on active service for the Republicans, Fisher was filling dispatches for the nation, the new statesmen, and newspapers in France, Norway, Sweden, and Czechoslovakia. Finally, he became an arms purchaser for the Republic, a job that kept him too busy to do much reporting. Fisher is an extreme example, and he appeared to see no dichotomy in his role. Other correspondents were aware of the thin line they were treading. When Madrid came under siege by the nationalist forces, a group of correspondents made the Florida Hotel their quarters. The group included Hemingway, Martha Gellhorn of Colliers, later Mrs. Hemingway, Sefton Delmer of the Daily Express, Herbert Matthews of the New York Times, and Antoine de Saint, de, de Saint Exupery, author of The Little Prince. Their sympathies were clearly with the Republicans, and Matthews, for one, has continued eloquently to defend their attitude. He had been attracted by the romantic glitter of the Italian army in Abyssinia, where, he freely admits, he had been little interested in the rights and wrongs of the war. Now, in Spain, he saw something beyond the immediate conflict. You who stroll along the great white way, thinking complacently how far away it is, all from peaceful America, you too will feel a tap on your shoulder one of these days and will hear the call. War has a long, long arm, and it is reaching out for all of us. Matthews was 36 and was deeply thoughtful about the duty of war correspondence and the ethics of his calling. All of us who lived the Spanish Civil War felt deeply emotional about it. I always felt the falseness and hypocrisy of those who claimed to be unbiased and the foolish, if not rank stupidity of editors and readers who demand objectivity or impartiality of correspondents writing about the war. It was the same old error which readers and editors always make and which forever continues to plague the chronicler who, being human, must have his feelings and opinions. In condemning bias, one rejects the only factors which really matter, honesty, understanding, and thoroughness. A reader has a right to ask for all the facts. He has no right to ask that a journalist or historian agree with him. This is a powerful argument, providing, as Matthews did, the correspondent makes his bias clear and does provide all the facts. But what can be said to justify the attitude of correspondents who knowingly wrote propaganda and disseminated it as honest reporting? The most glaring examples of this concern the activities of Agitprop, the Agitation and Propaganda Department of the Comintern in Paris. The war correspondents involved were Arthur Kessler and Claude Cockburn, writing under the name Frank Pitcairn. Kessler had been arrested, but after the fall of Malaga, on the orders of the nationalist press officer, Louis Bolin, uh, Louis Bolin, who wanted to shoot him as a spy, he was sentenced to death and spent three months in prison before being exchanged as a prisoner in Republican hands. Kessler described his experiences in a series of articles in the News Chronicle, and there aroused considerable interest. His bona fides as an honest, professional, and compassionate reporter, he had deleted from his articles details that might have prejudiced the chances of other British prisoners, was therefore considered impeccable when, the same year, his book, Spanish Testament, appeared. The book, with its harrowing details of nationalist atrocities, caused a wave of revulsion against General Frankel and his forces. It was not until 1954, 17 years later, that writers learned how they had been deceived. Kessler confessed that he had written Spanish Testament in Paris among frequent, amid frequent interruptions from the agitprop chief the German Willy Munzenberg. Munzenberg, a, journal, a brilliant journalist, had a talent for propaganda, especially for forming the Communist Front organizations and of persuading prominent people to support them 
the British Committee for the Relief of the Victims of Fascism, was one of his creations. He became too independent for Moscow's liking, broke with the party in late 1937, and was murdered mysteriously in France in 1940. Muz Munzenberg would burst into Kessler's flat. He would pick up a few sheets of pipe script, scan through them, and shout at me, Too weak! Too objective! Hit them! Hit them hard! Tell the world how they run over their prisoners with tanks, how they pour petrol all over them and burn them alive. Make the world gasp with horror. Hammer it into their heads. Make them wake up. Munzenberg showed Kessler a cutting from the Nazi paper Berliner Nachtauschgabe of a story datelined Madrid, November 4th, 1936, which ran, the Red Militia issues vouchers to the value of one peseta. Each voucher is good for one rate. The widow of a high official was found dead in her flat. By her bedside lay 64 of the vouchers. Kessler wrote that Munzenberg told him admiring, admiringly, that, Arturo, is propaganda. So, against his better judgment, Kessler in interpolated his accounts of authenticated nationalist atrocities, a number of highly doubtful ones provided by him from Munzenberg, and his readers had no way of knowing one from the other. The Cockburn episode is even more disturbing. Otto Katz, a Czech who was in Munzenberg's chief assistant and bodyguard in Paris was puzzling over ways of putting pressure on the French government to allow delivery of a consignment of arms to the Republicans. He decided that he and Cockburn would report an entirely fictitious battle to illustrate the gallant but unequal struggle the Republicans were waging. Cockburn confessed later, our chief anxiety was that with nothing to go on but the plans and the guidebooks, which were without contours, we might have Democrats and fascists firing at each other from either end of the avenue, with some traveling night editor might know had a bump in the middle. The fate according to the fight accordingly took place in very short streets and open squares. Katz was insistent that we use a lot of names of both heroes and villains, but express uncertainty over them. Thus, the confusion of the struggle outside the barracks had been impossible to ascertain whether the Captain Murillo, who died gallantly, was the same as the Captain Murillo, who a few months ago in Madrid, in the end, it emerged as one of the most factual inspiring and at the same time sober pieces of war reporting I ever saw. This is hardly to inspire much confidence in the reporting of the war, but then Cockburn's concept of the duty of a war correspondent differed radically from any so far considered. An incident during the Republican seas of the Alcazar best sums up Cockburn's attitude and as well illustrates the communist approach to reporting the war. Cockburn and the correspondent of Pravda and Izvestia, Mikhail Koltsov, were standing on the ramparts overlooking the fortress when they were joined by Louis Fischer. Koltsov immediately launched into a bitter attack on Fischer for having sent a dispatch saying that the Republican militia was demoralized and bewildered. Koltsov admitted this was true, but he argued that Fischer, with his worldwide reputation, could spread alarm and despondency, and that his dispatch had done more harm than 30 British MPs working for Franco. Fischer tried to defend himself by arguing that the facts were facts, and that his readers had a right to read the truth but both Koltsov and Cockburn would hear none of this. Who gave them such a right? 
Cockburn told his wife later. Perhaps when they have exerted themselves enough to alter the policy of their bloody government and the fascists are beaten in Spain, they will have such a right. This isn't an abstract question, it's a shocking war. There can be no validity in Cockburn's attitude. If readers are to have no right to facts, but only to what a war correspondent feels is in his side's best interest to reveal, then there is no use for war correspondence at all. A team of Munzenberg-trained propaganda writers would do a better job in a more honest manner. In the event, the outcome of the war revealed the basic flaw in Cockburn's approach to the war reporting. If a correspondent writes not what is true, but what he wishes was true, he has a 50% chance that the tide of the war will change and he will be proved right. But equally, it may not change, and he will be seen to have gotten the whole thing wrong. That's what happened to Cockburn. Examined today, the week's reports about Spain appear accurate in detail, but grossly wrong in terms of the overall situation, misleading in their optimism and in their confidence of an eventual Republican victory. Cockburn remained unrepentant. There seems to be two pieces to this problem, the extent to which I myself totally believed what I said, and the extent to which I was, more or less consciously, trying to get other people to believe it. But I don't think there is really such a clear line of division. Both reasons rendered Cockburn unfit to report the Spanish Civil War. The first, because, as the episode with Koltsov and Fisher showed, Believing what one writes is no justification for omitting what is true but incompatible with those beliefs. The second, because to try to get other people to believe only part of the story is one definition of a propagandist. Cockburn's conversion from correspondent to propagandist was perhaps the most clear, fully detailed case, but it was not the only one. And, as in most wars, in no field were the propagandists more active than in that concerning atrocities. Today, no one denies that a series of terrible events took place in Spain during the Civil War. In the first three months, in village after village, town after town, behind the Republican lines, the peasants and the workers took over, in the name of communism, anarchism, and whatever may have been the local political creed, and went about during this period uh, settling old scores. Some 60,000 people are said to have been killed of Republican terror, including 12 bishops, 283 nuns, 4,184 priests, and 2,365 monks. A similar purge was taking place on the nationalist side, and... Although the figures are more difficult to authenticate, it appears that the Nationalists murdered about the same number, including about 3,000 in Mallorca alone. The brutality on both sides was extraordinary, and the Republican side frequently had religious overtones. A crucifix was forced down the mouth of the mother of five Jesuits, writes Professor Thomas. 800 persons were thrown down a mine shaft, and, always, the moment of death would be greeted with applause as if it was the moment of truth in a corrida. Clearly, killing on this scale and in such a manner was important news, but the reader had a right to know it was occurring on both sides. But the few serious attempts to report massacres and atrocities were buried in an avalanche of reports, based on the flimsiest evidence, exaggerated to extract the maximum horror, and disseminated, in many cases, by professional propaganda agencies. We begin with Frederick Voigt, the Berlin representative of the Manchester Guardian, because one would have expected a higher standard of such a distinguished correspondent. Voigt arrived in Madrid on a short visit in April 1937, and promptly announced to the correspondents in the Florida Hotel that a reign of terror gripped the city and that thousands of bodies are being found. When pressed, 
He agreed that he had not seen any bodies himself, but remained convinced that, quote, there is terror here, end quote. A day or so later, he gave Martha Gellhorn of Colliers, who was leaving Spain for a spell, a sealed envelope to take out for him, assuring her that it was only a carbon copy of an already censored dispatch, which he was sending to the Manchester Guardian in case the original did not arrive. Fortunately, Miss Gellhorn told Hemingway what uh, she had agreed to do for Voigt, and Hemingway, suspicious, persuaded her to let him take the letter to the censor's office. When the censor opened the letter, it turned out to be not a carbon copy of an already censored dispatch, but an article that began, quote, There is a terror here in Madrid, thousands of bodies, end quote. Miss Gellhorn said that Hemingway was so angry with Voigt for having exposed her to the risk of being caught smuggling an uncensored dispatch that it was difficult to prevent Hemingway from punching him. Edward Nobla of the Associated Press was in Madrid in the early months of the war and was appalled by the Republican excesses. He wrote Correspondent in Spain, published while the war was still on and therefore a work of reportage. In one significant passage, Nobla brings together sex and violence in a way that epitomized the very worst of the post-Franco atrocity propaganda and helps explain the attitudes by many Catholic leaders. Nobla records how he sat at dinner with five anarchists. One of them, he says, boasted of how he made two priests dig their own grave, emasculated them, and then forced the severed organs into dying victims' mouths before finally shooting them. The point about this story is not whether it was true or false, but simply that Nobla tells it, and by telling it he invites his readers, without ever endorsing it himself, to accept it as true. For Roman Catholics, the killing of a priest is a sacrilege, a wound in the body of Christ, a matter of far greater importance, than the death of an anarchist or a communist. So the Catholic press, especially in the United States, was prepared to print, on the flimsiest evidence, stories like the one just quoted. A daily news service run by the National Catholic Welfare Conference provided the Catholic press with news, pictures, features, and editorials on the war. It was as biased in its own way as Munzenberg's agitprop was. In 1956, the American historian F.J. Taylor wrote in his book, The United States and the Spanish Civil War, A close examination of these dispatches would seem to indicate that factual reporting was circumscribed for the purpose of promoting Catholic interests. All the dispatches examined were strongly sympathetic to the nationalist cause with very little made what effort made whatsoever toward objective reporting. Since the NWC news service was controlled by the Catholic hierarchy, and so most Catholic publications relied upon the news service for news coverage in Spain, the hierarchy was in position to control the political convictions of many Catholics from a central point. And the main target for Catholic press was Herbert Matthews. His newspaper, the New York Times, was determined to cover the war with impartiality and had formulated a plan to achieve this. It would print the news from both sides and would give both equal prominence, equal length, and equal treatment. This scheme, fine in theory, was a disaster and pleased no one. To begin with, the Times correspondent with the Franco forces was William P. Carney, a Catholic who felt strongly about Republican excesses against the clergy, and who was simply not in Matthew's class as a correspondent. Giving his stories equal length with Matthew's often meant overplaying a bad story and cutting a good one. Next, the Times bullpen, its group of senior editors who read the news as it comes in, and decide how much of it will be printed and where it will appear in the paper, was dominated at that time by Catholics who were known to reflect a Catholic viewpoint when assessing the news, with resort results ranging from playing down stories about birth control 
to playing up stories expressing alarm over communism. And third, the Catholic opposition to Matthews was more active in pressing its campaign against him than his admirers were in supporting him. How was how the New York Times plan worked out in practice can best be assessed by two examples. In December 1937, Republicans were clinging to the recently captured Tarul. The Nationalists were so confident that it would soon fall to them that they issued a communique regarding announcing its recapture. Carney not only filed the communique to the Times, but also added a vivid description of how the citizens had joyfully received the Franco troops, cheering and giving the fascist salute. The Times used the story. That very day, Matthews and the photographer Robert Kappa were in Teruel after a difficult two-day journey, and of course, they found it still in Republican hands. On his return to Barcelona, Matthews filed the story, which included so many eyewitness details that the Times had to print it, even though it did little for Carney's credibility. Earlier, in March of 1937, a large Franco force had struck toward Guadalajara, north of Madrid, but was stopped well short of its objective. Matthews went there and found that the attacking troops had been Italian. They had been routed and had left behind prisoners, rifles, machine guns, and some disabled tanks. Matthews talked to the prisoners, he knew Italian, examined the arms, and watched the dead Italians being buried. Back in Madrid, he filed his story, an important one, because it contained the first positive evidence that Mussolini had sent not only arms and advisors, but also an expeditionary force a fact, at that time, of great political and emotional significance. To emphasize this point, Matthews wrote that the attacking troops were Italian and nothing but Italian. In New York, on the instructions of the assistant managing editor, Raymond McCaw, wherever the word Italian appeared in Matthews' copy, it was struck out and the word insurgent, one used to describe the Franco troops, was substituted. This was done even to the extent of making the quoted phrase read, they were insurgent and nothing but insurgent, thus completely distorting Matthew's point. To make matters worse, McCaw set a ca sent a cable to Matthews saying that the only papers to emphasize the Italian point had been those in Moscow and reporting and pointing out that, as far as the New York Times was concerned, we cannot print obvious propaganda for either side, even under bylines. Matthew's attitude then, and now, at the time of publishing in 1975, is that when an accredited correspondent tells his paper that he has seen something with his own eyes, the paper must believe him, or else discharge him. It must trust him more than it trusts his competitors, or his editors 3,000 miles away, or where the sense, what was the sense in sending him in the first place? From time to time during the war, Matthews reported that the Republican government was, was seriously considering reopening the churches, and in some dispatches he went so far as to suggest that the Vatican was not keen on this because it would weaken the case against the Republicans. Matthews turned out to be right, and subsequent evidence confirmed the Vatican's reluctance in the matter. But at the time, Catholic readers of the New York Times refused to believe that Matthew's reports could be other than propaganda in a campaign led by Dr. Joseph Thorning, a Catholic professor of history, was starting to persuade the Times to recall him. The Catholic press had passed the motion of no confidence in him, and in an address to the American Catholic History Association, Dr. Thorning referred to Matthews as, quote, that, red, that rabid red partisan, end quote. On the other hand, the campaign praised Carney as having shown a, quote, high degree of journalistic responsibility and personal courage, end quote, 
and for having written only, quote, straight news stories, end quote. And in 1939, the Knights of Columbus awarded Carney a gold medal for distinguished services to journalism in reporting the Spanish Civil War. Admi Matthew's admirers came to his aid. Eight well-known editors and journalists attacked Carney's reporting and concluded, we shall continue to read Herbert Matthews to discover what is really going on in Spain. Small wonder that the editor at the New York Times, responsible for the uh, letters column, complained, No matter who writes the dispatch from Spain, the other side will accuse him of broadcasting propaganda or downright lying. In all my ten or twelve years' experience with letters to the editor, I have never encountered a situation in which so much absolutely rabid partisanship was manifested. Its partnership, it is partisanship that cannot be reasoned with and which consequently gets nowhere. In the midst of this rabid partisanship, it is refreshing to be able to point out one dispatch dealing with an atrocity that has never been seriously challenged. It concerns the massacre of the prisoners at Badojaj on the frontier with Portugal on August 14, 1936 and subsequent days. It was written by J. Allen, a correspondent of the Chicago Tribune and is rightly the most often reprinted newspaper report of the Spanish Civil War. Allen had covered the Asturias uprising in Spain in 1934, had left journalism temporarily to write a book, and went back to work when the war broke out. He knew a lot about Spain and was perhaps the best informed correspondent writing for an American or British newspaper. He was in London when he heard rumors of what had happened after the nationalist troops, mostly Moors, took Badajoz, and so, accompanied by a Portuguese friend who knew his way around, he took a taxi to the frontier and crossed into Spain. Alan realized that he was late on the story. Two French journalists and one Portuguese had already sent reports, but Alan felt he could do better. I believe I was the first newspaper man who went there knowing what he was looking for. Alan was looking for evidence that the nationalists were collecting everyone they suspected of having fought against them when they captured the town, marching them to the bull ring and shooting them with machine guns. He soon found it. He saw two nationalists halt the man in workman's blouse and hold him while a third pulled back his shirt, bearing his right shoulder. The black and blue marks of a rifle butt could be seen, even after a week they showed, to the bull ring with him. Alan drives to the bull ring, recalling that he had once seen Juan Belmonte there on just such a night, watching the bulls being brought in for the next day's fight. This night is fodder for tomorrow's show is being brought in too. Files of men, arms in the air. At four o'clock in the morning, they are turned out into the ring through the gate by which the initial parade of the bullfights enters. There, machine guns await them. After the first night, the blood was supposed to be palm deep on the far side of the lane. I don't doubt it. Eighteen hundred men there were women too were mowed down there in some twelve hours. There is more blood than you could think in 1,820 bodies. The only real dispute over Allen's story has been over the number killed and as to whether they were all killed in the bull ring. Professor Thomas puts the total at below 2,000. But for every Allen, there was a Cecil Garati. Garati, reporting for the Daily Mail from the nationalist side, followed the nationalist troops in the region of Torre Hermosa, looking for red atrocities and helping himself to anything valuable. I took away an old English family Bible, which I thought would be an appropriate present for my small son, and a revolver which I gave to my chauffeur. In my nervousness, I am afraid I must have slipped an old Cordoba silver cigarette case into my hip pocket, as I found it there some time later. He describes finding the body of an old lady of 76, her head chopped off and her poor broken arms lying unnaturally as if trying to reach the bodies of her son and grandson. 
who a lion beat to death beside her, and he decides that the Reds and anarchists have a peculiar smell. One gets it in the churches that have been occupied by the Reds as well as their houses, but in this building it seemed to be concentrated and left me with the impression I should never be near a real anarchist again without my nostrils warning me of his presence. Finally, he has a government soldier brought to him for questioning before he is shot. He has no desire to escape his fate. He had the stoic Spanish indifference to death, his attitude being rather that he had backed the wrong horse and could not grumble at losing his stake. He went off to his death with less fuss than I make going to the dentist. We can dismiss Garrity as a poor correspondent writing for an audience already firm in its belief that the Reds were monsters and the Nationalists were fighting to save Christian civilization. Much more worrisome is what resulted from the understandable desire of correspondents with the Republican side that the democratic ideal should triumph over fascism, that Matthew's justice, legality, morality, and decency should prevail, and the ardent wish for a Republican victory that made most of them view the optimism and led them, consciously or unconsciously, to distort the reality of the situation. The result was that of major defects of the Republican side were ignored, that, as Orwell complained, History was written in terms not of what had happened, but what had ought to have happened according to various party lines, and that enduring symbols of the Russian, of the Republicans' cause, turned out, under examination, not to be quite what they had been made out to be. We will begin with what was perhaps the best known incident of the war, the bombing of Guernica.